In a showcase that definitely elevated his WBA rank, Big John Tate stopped Dwayne Bobbick in the first round after an earlier knockdown. There looked to be another knockdown before the first knockdown, but no count was administered after the referee separated the two. Bobbick's disappointing pro career was the opposite of his amateur career, and he would only fight once more five months later, losing by stoppage on cuts. Bobbick is alive today, but unfortunately dealing with CTE, the after effects of the blows he took in the ring. John Tate, meanwhile, marched on toward potential history. In an event billed as Star Wars, broadcasted on ABC Primetime TV, two important matches took place. The undercard match was a contest between contenders the Black Hercules Ken Norton and the Black Destroyer Ernie Shavers, with the two both having been solid opponents for Muhammad Ali and Larry Holmes. It was expected that this bout would be a well-contested bout at the very least. Norton and Shavers were ranked 1 and 2 respectively by the WBC, and Norton was a 9-5 to five betting favorite. Boxing fans were also anticipating a rematch between Holmes and Norton after their spectacular fight almost a year earlier. In the first round, Ernie Shavers derailed any immediate plans of a rematch and stopped Norton after two vicious knockdowns. Referee Mills Lane stopped the bout at the request of Norton's corner after the second knockdown, and it was all over. Once again, as with Big George, Norton fell to a murderous puncher, and the boxing world would be getting a rematch, but of Holmes and Shavers. The main event of the night was Larry Holmes' second WBC title defense to be contested against unbeaten Puerto Rican challenger Asi Ocasio. The fight saw Holmes finish Aussie in the seventh round after four knockdowns. The first knockdown came from a jab, a testament to the greatness of Holmes. The only other fighter I can think of that knocked someone down with a jab was Riddick Big Daddy Bo. Larry Holmes had just defended his WBC title for the second time and was looking strong in his championship reign. The boxing world now looked forward to the rematch between the now champion Larry Holmes and the man who tested his courage, his former sparring partner, Ernie Shavers. Ozzy Ocasio only fought a few more times at heavyweight, but dropped down to cruiserweight and became a world champion at that level. Round one, with Muhammad Ali gone, the WBA organized a four-man tournament for their title, of which you can see the finer details in the video dedicated to it, linked below. Big John Tate and Kali Kanutsa opened things up with Tate scoring a late TKO in the eighth after Kanutsa gassed out. On June 15th, one of the greatest sequels in a masterclass on making sequels was released in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Rocky II had big shoes to fill after the success of the first film and wasted no time doing so. The film takes place immediately after the first, showing Rocky and Apollo in the aftermath of their death match. Rocky is propelled into overnight celebrity akin to Sylvester Stallone in real life. At the request of Adrian, he retires to a life of marriage, fatherhood, and blue-collar work. Rocky also has a bad eye after the fight, further forcing his retirement. However, this doesn't work out for Rocky as he's slowly drawn back to the boxing ring as financial problems arise after he blows his fortune from the Apollo fight. Speaking of the champion. Apollo has a change of heart from the end of the original film, now enraged that Rocky took him the distance. Apollo spins the movie trying to go Rocky out of retirement for a rematch so that he can show how the fight really would have gone had he taken it seriously. The goading finally pulls Rocky out of retirement after a new show in which Apollo calls Rocky a coward while showing off his skill. 
Choosing to defend his manhood, Rocky and Mickey set out to prepare for a rematch with Creed, much to Adrian's disappointment. Rocky and Adrian also learn that they're having a baby and the overall stress of life comes down hard on them both as Rocky struggles to focus in training and Adrian falls into a coma after premature birth after Pauly pushes things too far one day at the pet shop, a job Adrian had to return to to help alleviate the financial burden. Stallone's acting chops really show through in the hospital as Rocky cries and begs for Adrian to make it. She does make it, and Rocky feels more motivated than ever to win after Adrian finally provides her support. But is it too late with the fight drawing near? Rocky even manages to master fighting right-handed as a means of protecting his bad eye. On fight night, Rocky is badly outclassed by Apollo and will need a knockout for the win. Apollo's pride ultimately costs him the title as he fights desperately for the knockout refusing to allow Rocky to go the distance again. Rocky rallies in the final round after switching back to Southpaw and floors Creed. And himself. Whoever stands up first wins the championship and it's a really dramatic affair. Rocky makes it to his feet and Creed slumps back to the canvas, suffering his first ever professional loss. Rocky Balboa is the new heavyweight champion of the world and ends the movie with arguably the most famous line in the series. Yo, Adrian! I did it! This was the last Rocky movie released in the 70s, as the next two followed in the 80s. Sylvester Stallone and company had done it again. Rocky II is a certified classic and the closest in tone to the original. In fact, it's arguably better than the original. On June 22nd at MSG in New York, Larry Holmes defended the WBC Heavyweight Championship of the World against number eight ranked challenger, Mike Hercules Weaver. Weaver wasn't expected to be much of a challenge for Larry, but he proved formidable and managed to have the crowd behind him. The two spent the fight pounding away at one another all leading to the 11th where Holmes dropped Weaver with an uppercut that contained all of Holmes' will. Weaver survived, but would be stopped in the 12th when Holmes overwhelmed him and the referee had seen enough. It was the third defense for Holmes and another testament to how entertaining a champion he was. Weaver put on a great showing, but just wasn't enough for the champion. Weaver's crowning moment would come the next year against John Tate in a late fight shocker. Larry and Mike would also have a rematch 21 years later in Biloxi, Mississippi, a match that would see Holmes stop Weaver again, this time in the sixth round. Holmes was 51, Weaver was 49. If I'm not mistaken, we're due for Holmes Weaver 3 this year, since they seem to like fighting 21 years apart. Round two, on the other end of the bracket, former undisputed champion Leon Spinks returned to the ring for the first time since the Ali duology against South African contender Harry Kutsia. It had been nine months since Spinks lost the WBA title to Ali. Now he was out to regain it. Rather shockingly, Kutsia dwarfed the former champion with three knockdowns in the opening round to secure the TKO victory and move on to the finale against Big John Tate. Spinks wouldn't fight again until the opening of the new decade. With this, the finale was set to be determined between the two undefeated young bucks Kusia and Tate. Who's the WBA champion? Muhammad Ali held on to the title after winning it for an unprecedented third time, cherishing his time as a global icon. Bob Arum was working to get Ali to retire so that he could promote a bout for the WBA title and advance the division. Arum paid Ali $300,000 to get the reluctant champion to officially retire so that the title could be back in action. In June, Ali sent an official letter of retirement to the WBA 
and on July 27th, the feat was accomplished and a long sought bout between the WBA's top contenders was finally set in stone. History was repeating itself, or rather rhyming. Just as the WBA had sought to replace Ali with an eight-man eliminator series back in 1967 when the champion was sent into exile, it was doing so again now with a four-man elimination tournament at Ali's retirement. The bionic hand, Harry Kutsia, Big John Tate, Kali Kanutsa, and Olympic champion Leon Neon Spinks were the contestants. Larry Holmes, meanwhile, was set out to reunify the titles, something he would unfortunately never achieve. Five months, give or take, since Norton was blasted by Ernie Shavers, he returned to the ring against Scott Ledoux. Ledoux, too, had lost his last bout, a 10-round split decision to Ron Lyle. The bout would serve to showcase the inevitable truth that Norton was now past his best. A thumb to the eye in the eighth only made things worse for Norton, as Ledoux rallied and dropped Norton in the final round. When the dust settled, the fight was declared a draw, the only draw, of Norton's career. One month later, the Black Hercules announced his retirement in the aftermath of his trainer Bob Byron passing away stating he couldn't go on without him. Norton was so disappointed in his performance, however, that he elected to return to boxing in 1980. Mike Weaver hopped on the comeback trail three months to the day since losing a gallant war with Larry Holmes. It was a baptism as Weaver dropped Terrell four times, once in the first, another in the third, and two final times in the fourth. Looking good there, Hercules. It was on, again, but this time, it was for the WBC Heavyweight Championship. Larry Holmes and Ernie Shavers were ready to get it on again, but was it to be a repeat of their bout from the previous year? Remember that Holmes outright dominated the action against Shavers in a 12-round test of courage. Bundini Brown attended the press conference and barked on behalf of the Big Black Cloud. And I bring that up to reference that even in his retirement, Ali's shadow still lingered over the sweet science. Holmes was the champion, but still lived as if he were a fighter on the come up, fighting tooth and nail for everything he had. He stayed in bad hotels and was mistaken for others in public for autographs. Larry was criminally underrated and overlooked but it worked in his favor as it kept him hungry. Anyone would have been in that position coming off the hills of the Ali reign, but you can't blame Holmes for being bitter to an extent, especially considering that years later, Mike Tyson would get the adoration Holmes had rightfully earned during his reign. Back to the rematch with Shavers. Holmes dominated the first six rounds in similar fashion to the first fight, but never underestimate the true chance of a puncher. Shavers had proved his puncher's chance was the best of all against Ken Norton, and when he decked Holmes with a killer right in the seventh round, it appeared it had all come crashing down for the young champion. Then, out of nowhere, Larry revived and rose to his feet as if he were a man returning to life from his grave. It brings to mind how Tyson Fury rose against the Wilder knockdown. Even more impressive was the fact that Holmes recovered well enough to take back control over the action leading into the 11th, where he was badly battering Shavers. The referee stepped in to save Ernie, and Larry had once again proven that he was the real deal. This win was arguably even more impressive than the first, it was the fourth title defense for Larry Holmes and still just the beginning of his dominance over the division. The WBA's tournament to crown a new champion after Ali vacated the title was to conclude with a culturally significant bout as black American Big John Tate took on white South African, the Boxburg bomber, Harry Kutsia. The event took place at Loftus Versfeld Stadium in Pretoria, Gauteng, South Africa, a pretty big deal considering this was during the apartheid era. 
This spout was so badly desired by South Africa, who so desperately wanted a homegrown champion, that the government finally allowed its black citizens into the venue to sit among its white citizens. It drew the biggest boxing crowd in over 50 years. The fight was nothing special seeing Tate win an uneventful 15 round unanimous decision. What was significant was the effect that the bout had on South Africa. The first match to change the face of apartheid in South Africa was the 1973 bout between Bob Foster and Pierre Fury. While white South Africans backed Harry, black South Africans backed Tate. This was all in spite of the fact that Harry opposed apartheid. Black citizens held no ill will toward Harry, but they just couldn't bring themselves to cheer someone white after what their government had done to them. This was the last heavyweight bout of notoriety in the 1970s, a fitting way to end the decade heading into the 1980s. At the conclusion of 1979 and the 1970s as a whole, these were Ring Magazine's top 10 ranked heavyweights. Well, no unification. John Tate won the tournament for the WBA crown and Larry Holmes continued strong in defending the WBC strap. Contenders continued lining up and hopefully the two champs fight in the new decade. Hopefully. Harry could see a blasting Neon Leon, the former undisputed heavyweight champion, and the latter's return to the ring since the Ali duology is the upset of the year. A notable win despite Kusia failing to capture the WBA title in the tournament finale. The ring's round of the year was not a heavyweight honor, but for this chronology, it has to go to round eight of the Holmes Shavers title bout. Holmes rebounded from being knocked down in the last round to stagger Ernie, but failed to put Ernie away. The ring did not award fight of the year to the heavyweight division, but if there had to be one for the honor, it would have to be the exciting rematch between Larry Holmes and Ernie Shavers. The ring's fighter of the year, again, was not awarded to a heavyweight, but Larry Holmes easily takes the cake for our retrospective. On February 16th, Greg Page made his debut with a second round knockout win. On October 30th, Tim Witherspoon debuted with an opening round TKO victory. In both men's final bout of the 70s, Mike Weaver defended the USBA title in a 12 round unanimous decision win over Scott Ledoux. Weaver continued ascending since the loss to Holmes and would head into 1980 to challenge Big John Tate for the WBA title. You don't want to miss that one. Jimmy Young and Ozzy Ocasio got it on again on January 27th, and Ocasio once again got the win. This time, it was a unanimous decision. The bout took place on the same grounds that Young banished George Foreman into retirement. Later, on September 28th, Young fought up-and-coming Young Lion Michael Dynamite Dokes, dropping a unanimous decision. He fought once more in the 70s, before acting as a rite of passage of sorts for upcoming 80s contenders in the next decade. He retired on September 22, 1990. For the first time since 1959, Muhammad Ali, Joe Frazier, and George Foreman weren't featured on any card. They would all return in the 1980s to varying success. Ali would be dangerously exposed. Frazier would bode well enough as a shell of himself, and Foreman would execute the greatest comeback in boxing history. Muhammad Ali had an exhibition against Denver Broncos defensive end Lao Azado. The bout went eight full rounds and was called a draw. Hopes of heavyweight unification died in November and the next year would see six title fights, four for the WBC title and two for the WBA title. No one could reach a deal, a sad reality that we're still burdened by 
today. Speaking of splintered titles, Ernie Shavers pursued Larry Holmes under the WBC umbrella in 1979 and fell short of becoming champ. But what if he were to join the WBA tournament? He was ranked second after all. If Shavers elects to pursue the WBA title, perhaps this timeline would be discussing how the Black Destroyer finally managed to become heavyweight champion. The Holmes rematch wound up being Ernie's last fight in the 70s and the 80s would see him fluctuate between borderline contender and journeyman. He had a four-year hiatus from 1983 to 1987, where he would fight only once in 87, before returning in 1995 to fight twice and retire for good. The 1970s began with the title splintered and ended in the same way. The issue was only made worse by the boxing world growing sick and tired of the WBC and WBA's monopoly of sorts on the sport. By the end of the 80s, two more sanctioned bodies, the International Boxing Federation or IBF and the World Boxing Organization or WBO would be in the boxing sweepstakes with titles of their own. This would lead to the death of the dream match era of boxing that had gone back to the sport's inception. To this day, Politics, sanctioning bodies, money, and boxer camps shape whether certain fights will take place. Whereas it was looked down upon to duck an opponent back then, today it's a part of the sport. As of my writing this, Tyson Fury and Anthony Joshua are scheduled to fight in Israel on August 14th of 2021 to unify the heavyweight championship. It will be the first time we've had an undisputed heavyweight champion since Lennox Lewis 20 years ago. Ah, there's an audible on the play. Deontay Wilder all of a sudden wants to enforce the rematch now when the fight of the decade was finally slated to happen. Their third bout will take place on July 24th of 2021 in Las Vegas. Or so we thought as the fight has been postponed to October 9th due to Fury's camp having an outbreak in the camp. Fury won the explosive affair, surviving two knockdowns and dishing out three knockdowns of his own, the last one winning him the fight. At the conclusion of the 1970s, the landscape of the heavyweight division had changed drastically. The three pillars of the division, Ali, Frazier, and Foreman, had hung up the gloves. The heavyweight championship was splintered to begin the decade and was splintered exiting the decade. The lineage was disrupted by Ali's retirement after he'd beaten Spinks to become a historical three-time heavyweight champ. But Larry Holmes looked to be well on his way to picking up the lineage through his dominance of the division. If I had to award a round of the decade for the heavyweights, it would have to go to rounds four and five of the Foreman Lao fight from 1976. Those guys were trying to kill one another in there, and it was a true test of wills. As for fight of the decade, the answer for me has to be a two-way tie between the fight of the century and the Thrilla in Manila. Ali and Frazier had the kind of rivalry we'll probably never see again similar to the lightning caught in the bottle in the world of wrestling that was Stone Cold Steve Austin against The Rock. Ring Magazine awarded Roberto Duran as fighter of the decade, but if we had to give the title to a heavyweight, most wouldn't hesitate to give it to Muhammad Ali. He returned from exile and suffered some big losses, redeemed said losses, became champion again in the same manner that he did a decade earlier in the 60s defended the title against the best competition, and regained the title for a then unprecedented third time. All this while working with eroded skills and being past his best as the years passed. However, unfortunately enough, it wasn't over yet for the fighter who proved he was the greatest. He was about to attempt to become champion for an impossible fourth time against the man who was his sparring partner for a good deal of the decade.
This fight's significance to be included in this chronology despite not taking place in the 70s is for a variety of reasons. Holmes was the best champion since Ali and picked up the reins from Ali in 1979. Holmes was Ali's sparring partner. Holmes was the reigning WBC champion. But most important of them all, Ali retired as the lineal champion, leaving the lineage splintered. Holmes was already deep in the shadow of Ali in the eyes and hearts of boxing fans and hadn't managed to unify the heavyweight championship. The opportunity came for Holmes when Ali announced he was coming back for the title and on July 17th, the two signed to fight on October 2nd. The Easton Assassin readied himself to stake claim to one piece of the fragmented crown. On October 2nd of 1980, at Caesars Palace in Las Vegas, Nevada, undefeated WBC champion Larry Holmes squared off against his idol, the man he'd practically lived with and under to become the dominant champion he was, Ahmed Ali. The fight was a heartbreaker. People wanted so badly to believe Ali was still the man they remembered, even choosing him to decision Holmes, but it wasn't reality. Ali had already shown signs of waning health in the last days of the 70s. So to see him against the prime homes when he had zero business in the ring was the equivalent of watching a one-legged man in an ass-kicking competition. Holmes easily outboxed and battered Ali before the fight was stopped at the end of the 10th by Ali's trainer, Angelo Dundee. Larry Holmes was the new lineal champion and would go on to be one of the greatest champions of all time. As finished as Ali should have been, sadly, it wasn't the end. He'd fight one more time a year later before finally hanging up the gloves for good. Going back to 1977 after the bout with Ernie Shavers, Ali's health concerns called for his retirement, yet these pleas by Dr. Ferdy Pacheco were ignored and Ali's deterioration under Parkinson's was expedited. With the conclusion of the bout between Ali and Holmes, the 70s was done. The arguable two best fighters from the decade put the stamp on the ballot. The 80s would turn out to be an era of lost and wasted talent, often referred to as the lost generation. For the full timeline of Larry Holmes in the 1980s lost generation, the link to both documentaries are in the description. If I had to rank the top 10 fighters from the 70s, bottom to top, it would go Joe Bugner, Jerry Quarry, Jimmy Young, Ron Lyle, Ernie Shavers, Ken Norton, Larry Holmes, Joe Frazier, George Foreman, and Muhammad Ali. On the note of ranking, if I had to rank the years of the 70s from least to most exciting, it would go 72, 70, 71, 79, 77, 78, 76, 73, 74, and 75. The top three years are interchangeable for the number one spot as the division was white hot, must see action. I'd like to personally thank the fallen warriors of the 70s who stamped history and set an unprecedented bar on the sport. Bob Foster, Oscar Bonavina, Irish Jerry Quarry, Ron Lyle, Jimmy Ellis, Neon Leon Spinks, Jimmy Young, the gentleman of boxing, Floyd Patterson. The Black Destroyer, Ernie Shavers. The Black Hercules, Ken Norton. Charles, Sonny Liston. Smokin' Joe Frazier. And the Louisville Lip. The greatest of all times, Muhammad Ali. A thank you as well to the living legends of the golden era of heavyweight boxing. The Bay and Bleeder in real life Rocky Chuck Webner, Ozzy Joe Buckner, 
George Boom Boom Shivalo, Big George Foreman, and the Big Black Cloud, the Eastern Assassin, Larry Holmes. Now you all know me, this channel is the headcanon central of the internet and that means I've got to do a what if on Sonny Liston in the 70s division. This, along with another project I'm working on that will pit the best of the 70s and the 90s against one another in a massive heavyweight tournament to find an undisputed champ, is coming in the future. I'd also like to thank you all for your patience. This video took forever to make and there was a point where I was almost done with it and all of my progress was erased due to my own folly. I had to start from the top, but I took it for what it was and feel I was able to make this video better because of it. I hope you all enjoyed this retrospective look back into the golden age of heavyweight boxing, and I'll see you next time. I'd also like to take the time to thank the wonderful individuals who post boxing footage and pull matches on YouTube. Thanks for everything. This has been The Charles Jackson. Peace.